and welcome to Business Line. Over recent years, after the 2008 financial crisis, some of the world's biggest banks paid billions in fines for helping wealthy clients evade taxes. Governments have also been tightening controls over big multinational corporations and rich individuals trying to stop them from taking money out from the country. The so-called Panama Papers revealed some of those fighting the issues of tax avoidance and money laundering also have their financial secrets. That comes from over 11 million files from the database of one of the world's biggest offshore law firms. Almost all of the movers and shakers on the Panama Papers list deny any wrongdoing. And they are right. That might sound strange, but many of the schemes described in the leaked files are entirely legal. How is that possible? This is our look at some of the most popular financial practices. Holding money in offshore companies is not illegal, but it's claimed there's evidence of funds being hidden for tax evasion, money laundering and sanctions busting of the companies that appear in Mossack Fonseca's files. The British Virgin Islands are where half of them were apparently incorporated. The second favourite jurisdiction is said to be Panama, where Mossack Fonseca is headquartered. And then there are other islands. Assets can be hidden and taxes dodged in lots of ways. So-called shell companies have nothing in size. They just manage money and can hide who owns it. An offshore financial centre, what's often called a tax haven, is somewhere providing secrecy while most banking services are legal. And then there's money laundering, which involves making dirty money good for use. New Zealand is identified among a wider list of 21 tax havens used by Mossack Fonseca. The country's Prime Minister has issued a defence. New Zealand has had the same tax laws when it comes to trust since 1988. New Zealand also had a review undertaken by the OECD in 2013 and they gave New Zealand a clean bill of health. But the door has been opened on a vast trove of documents and data on offshore financial dealings and the questions will not abate. A massive leak that casts light on the tactics used to avoid taxes and skirt financial oversight. The Panama Papers revelations renew criticism of government's efforts to tackle tax avoidance. Transparency International believes there is a way to solve the problem and it's a three-step process. So, first of all, levels of transparency that would give governments a better idea of the companies registered in their territories, especially when it comes to those behind business. The second step, professional enablers that are found to be complicit in corruption must be sanctioned. And thirdly, all countries should require any company bidding for public contracts or purchasing property to disclose on whose behalf they are operating. The European Union is currently working on a new law on tax avoidance that's focused on big companies. The draft, due to present it next week, would oblige multinationals to publicly disclose tax and financial data for every EU country in which they operate. However, Transparency International is not convinced, as the law would only apply to big companies in terms of their turnovers, and that's just a handful of firms. According to a study by the European Parliament, tax evasion by multinationals cost the bloc between 50 and 70 billion euros a year in lost revenues. And that's just for this region and just for multinationals. Now think of the possible global losses from the practices described in the leaked files. Well, the EU has been working on a balanced solution that would fit all of its members, the Panama Papers revealed many names outside the European Union. And one of those is Russia's president. For years, there have been rumors about Vladimir Putin's secret wealth. But a detailed picture of the hidden financial dealings of the Russian president remained elusive. The so-called Panama Papers may disclose an even bigger network than imagined. Putin's name does not appear in the leaked documents, but those of some of his very close friends do. These are comrades whose history with Putin goes back decades to St. Petersburg, known as Leningrad before the fall of the Soviet Union. That's where Putin met Sergei Roldugin, who rose to fame as a cellist and conductor. He introduced Putin to his first wife, Ludmila, and is the godfather of their daughter, Maria. Both men are described as best friends. Another close friend whose name appears in the leaked papers, Yuri Kovalchuk, is often referred to as Putin's personal banker. 
He's at the helm of Rossiya Bank, based in St. Petersburg and at the heart of the offshore financial dealings. According to the papers, this is how it works. Rossiya Bank helps create shell companies in Roldigan's name, such as Sonet Overseas or International Media Overseas. Seven companies in his name are registered offshore, in the tax havens of Panama, Belize and the Virgin Islands. The shell companies are registered via a discreet law firm specialized in offshore planning, Mossack Fonseca, which later signs off loans to them. The loans come from the Russian commercial bank in Cyprus, a subsidiary of the Russian state-owned bank VTB. And the funds go into the coffers of the offshore companies. One of them, Sandalwood Continental in the Virgin Islands, received more than a billion U.S. dollars in loans between 2009 and 2012. During that period, Sandalwood reportedly lent more than $10 million to the ski resort of Igora, where Putin's daughter Katerina threw a lavish wedding party in 2013. It's claimed up to $2 billion have been funneled outside of Russia through President Putin's close friends. The Kremlin has slammed the revelations as lies, attempting to destabilize the president. This time in our IT dedicated segment, we take a closer look at a car. They say high tech and automotive are converging and if Tesla is involved, it's not hard to see why. After a sneak preview of its Model 3, thousands rushed to order the car, even though it is more than a year away from production. What's all this fuss about? This is it. This is IT. California-based Tesla is being buoyed by bumper pre-orders of its Model 3 electric car. Its chief executive says they stood at 276,000 on Saturday. The car can be pre-ordered in a string of countries, including China, the UK and India. Pre-orders don't always translate into actual sales. We'll see when the Model 3 starts to be delivered next year. 276,000 orders garnered in just three days is really something, especially if you consider that 115,000 people had signed up before the car was even unveiled. With a base price of $35,000, the Model 3 is supposed to represent Tesla's first foray into the mass market. Whether we can talk about an electric car for the people, though, is a moot point. Elon Musk admits that a Model 3 with an average mix of features will cost about $42,000. If you live in the U.S., you better be high on the list, because once electric vehicle sales hit $200,000, the $7,500 tax credit begins decreasing incrementally. Still, the onslaught of pre-orders surprised Musk, who said that the company will have to rethink production planning. Otherwise, predicts Fortune, about half of the first day orders for the Model 3 will not be fulfilled until 2019. So, what do we know about the Model 3? We know it will go from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in less than 6 seconds. We know its range before acquiring a charge will be at least 345 kilometers. We know it has autopilot features and emergency braking enable a standard. And finally, we know that its interior is incredibly simple. The only two elements on the dashboard are the steering wheel and a plain 15-inch touchscreen supplied by LG. That was it. That was IT. And that was it for now. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.